things around a bit uh, for this session, um, rather than doing a pure panel discussion, which we're also going to do, we're going to do a few presentations first, um, by Ryan Kazan, whom I'm going to introduce later, Michael Salton, by Ansala Pareda, practicing architect. I'm going to do a short introduction on the work we do here at the GSD on ceramics. And then we're going to invite them and uh, Carlos Solana, a fabricator, to the, to the table for a little bit of discussion. And then, of course, we'll invite and look for questions from you and hope to have an interesting conversation. So, um, why don't I get this started and uh, I'll introduce the, the speakers later. Um, I thought this would be a nice opportunity uh, for those of you who are relatively new here to learn a little bit also about what we have been doing here at the school in the area of ceramics, because uh, with the gentleman back there, Anthony Kane and Nathan King, and a few others that I don't see now, but they're not sure here, uh, we've been working on ceramics for about uh, three years, um, sponsored by Carlos Spain. And uh, there are a few things that we don't do. So what we don't do is a kind of thing that happened in the Japanese construction industry in the, in the, in the 90s, which is a kind of construction automation approach, designing custom machines to build relatively standard buildings. Okay? Uh, so that's something that we don't do. Uh, what they did, they designed custom technology to basically make relatively uninteresting architects. So what we try to do is use standard equipment, the robots that we know very well that are downstairs, and we try to create value with those standard machines to design. So our research is really focused on design exploration. Uh, so just a couple of projects that we've done over the past uh, three years. Uh, some are very close to the reality of construction. Other are a little bit more speculative, and I'm just going to do this very, very briefly to leave most of the time for our invited guests. Uh, this is how tires are produced industrially at this time. You see basically a mass production line uh, where the tires go down that line about one tire every second. Every tire is exactly the same. High degree of control, high degree of automation, relatively few people, no waste. Uh, so these are automatic facilities and they produce the kind of tires that you can buy pretty much anywhere. Um, and this is a great system, but it, it has some challenges, uh, uh, which we've been working on. The challenge is, of course, of this mode of production is customization. Um, so while we know this kind of thing quite well, uh, and we can't do really this anymore here in the Boston area, for example, where labor costs are very high, the kind of mosaic, mosaic patterns are hard to do here. What we looked at in this first project is, could we do this? And could we use robotics to do it? Um, so using the standard product, not actually questioning the industrial logic of production, but trying to add something to the product through robotic intervention, in this case, by placement. So this, we worked together with the uh, Panagopoulos Nikolatos, and um, Nathan worked on this, Amanda Lee worked on this, um, and uh, Anthony worked on this as well. So we have two ways of generating a pattern. One is just insert an image, input what kind of tiles you have, and then uh, through Russia, we essentially get uh, a pattern that now produces that image in the tile sizes that you have available. The other way of generating the pattern is through a controlled random algorithm. And then, still within Rhino, basically is an automation that produces ultimately the code that we need to run the robot. And here we have just an example of doing the first test of putting the tiles down on a standard backer board. Uh, this is just prototyping, so this is not a production system. But uh, I'm quite confident that, that within a relatively short time, we could actually have this system ready for an industrial use. Um, and there's a bunch of other things we can do with a very developed spacing, having just different kind of patterns. We decided to use the image of this lady here and this particular segment to try this out, to see whether this is really working. So this is a fair number of tiles, right? To do this by hand, manually placing these tires would be not impossible, but would take a long time. It would cost uh, probably too much money. Um, in a prototyping stage, this still takes a long time because still solving questions and answering uh, to certain issues that arise. But this is now the tiles placed, and the image is somewhat recognizable. 
uh, we did some numbers, and it seems not going into in, in any kind of detail, talking to installers that the kind of cost would be about comparable what it would cost to install a standard wall, but here we have a way to customize a pattern uh, without really any kind of extra cost. Uh, so this is uh, this virtual project. Uh, another one is came out of a course I taught last year. The course was called Ceramics Lab, taught together with Nathan King. Uh, and three students, uh, Stefan Andreani, Jose Lewis, and Argo, who are actually now today at the Acadia Conference uh, in California presenting this project, they came up with a way of wire cutting clay using this whole robot. And they designed the entire automation tools uh, needed to do that. So, so we took that project to RPI. Uh, to the Smart Geometry Conference uh, earlier this year and had the, the participants experiment with this device. So this is very, very open-ended, completely different mindset from the first project, which is really about addressing a problem. This is an open-ended speculation. They make these pieces, which are interesting, they're beautiful, uh, and you know they're, they're new pieces, right? So this is exploring design potential by starting with the technology and seeking for new opportunities. Uh, of course, this is somewhat still guided by the understanding that there's an issue of customization in the industry. You see, again, the cost of doing different tiles would be relatively small. But it's a very open-ended, kind of studio-based, uh, exploratory process. Um, uh, but interesting also, the size that within three days now, people that have never used it over before can actually be doing things in a somewhat productive way. Well, I should say three days and three nights, uh, because these workshops tend to be quite uh, tense. Um, so a third project, just very, very brief, is something much more focused on issues of performance. Again, this is much more targeted. Uh, it, it, it looks at rice weight producing shaped ceramic lamellas. And we worked with um, a colleague at the time, Crystal Reinhardt, who is now a professor at MIT who is specializing in daylighting, energy analysis. So we basically produce an integrated workflow out of Rhino that has all the kind of uh, daylighting analysis for the shading system, outputting annualized heating and cooling loads, outputting also a glare analysis. Uh, and within Rhino, we then automated the design of these lamellas to eventually produce lamellas in a, on our robotic workshop in the basement. Um, so these are just various uh, test studies, uh, uh, trying out different kinds of lamellas. I'm going to go through this very fast. So we use this screen as a kind of design experiment to design all aspects of the workflow and of the production system. And I think in terms of methods, approaches, the kind of design experiment approach is just quite useful uh, to approach various topics uh, of research and technology. Uh, we make this mode that is uh, basically put into position by the robot. It's relatively low cost mode. Uh, it can be used to shape the tile that is being produced by extruding essentially clay over that surface. Uh, this is the extruder we built uh, uh, in the shop uh, with the team finishing the tiles. Uh, these are some of the tiles produced on that system that come out of that workflow. So addressing the issue of facade design, which is a complex issue that has to merge and address many, many different issues and topics. Um, so we, we try to find a kind of somewhat far out approach to customize, to radically customize the shading of us. Uh, so he is putting together the prototype, which eventually went to Spain for an exhibition, uh, and then just opposing it with the facade next door, which is the kind of industry standard extrusion process. Same material, but this is the kind of standard extrusion. Here's our often variable shading lamella. And the hope, of course, is that this goes a bit further. So, working with uh, with our sponsors, we try to connect now to various industrial companies to kind of look at the next phase for some of these uh, projects. So, this is just a little glimpse of the kinds of things we do. And of course, in academia, we can, we can take certain liberties. Uh, which uh, in the practice of, of the tile business and in architecture you can't take. So that's why we brought different voices to this session to get a kind of Noah's art of perspectives. And the next person in that perspective is going to be this, uh, Ryan Tazan, uh, who uh, came to us. Thank you, Ryan, for coming. So Ryan is uh, a tile consultant, so he's really knowledgeable through his background 
in the technologies, production methods, installation methods of pions. He knows a lot of pet products, and I think you're going to give us a bit of a sense of what's actually out there in interesting products and yeah. techniques, and maybe think a little bit about the future, sort of what are the next steps. Yeah. So Ryan comes on. Please welcome Ryan. So I'm a technical consultant for Tile of Spain, a uh, manufacturers association that has a, a partnership and sponsorship here with uh, Harvard GSD. Um, I generally do a lot of these seminars for uh, practicing architects and, and commercial designers um, and, and North American media as well, and try and expose them to what we don't see here in North America quite frequently, which is sort of a peak of the surrounding tile industry that you see when you go to the European trade shows and things like that. So I wanted to share um, some of the directions that the industry is going and hopefully give you guys some inspiration for your, your ongoing projects. Um, so I'll give you a snapshot of, of the Manufacturers Association and then we'll move into uh, some current innovations as well. Um, I just took a quick tour of your facility here, and I am so jealous of all of you. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity. The field of ceramics, I've based my career around for about 18 years now. Um, it's one of the most amazing mediums to work with. Some of the, some of the most respectable artists have said that uh, ceramics is, is their absolute favorite medium because of all of the opportunities presented by it. So we're going to get into some of those, and I hope I give you some inspiration for your future projects. Um, one of the key considerations for the cluster in, uh, uh, in Spain is to reach outside their um, industrial cluster for some inspiration for these innovations. They actively pursue work with different uh, post-secondary institutions around the world, and then they also reach out to the professional community. Uh, they get a lot of... Um, big name designers to, to both work on uh, commercial material and then work on custom stuff for their projects as well. Get into a few very simple custom uh, ceramic projects that have been very effective throughout Europe uh, that have been sponsored Tile of Spain uh, projects. So this ongoing collaboration is so important for the cluster because innovation is really uh, sort of the backbone of the industry in Spain is what they're known for and uh, they, they truly want your input. Um, so know that the projects that are going on here have, have real value to uh, uh, the Manufacturers Association. So why, why do I find ceramics to be so inspirational um, and, and why I base my career around it is, is really they're so central to so many aspects of our life and so many different societal advancements. Uh, throughout history, there's some extinct societies that we know of only through the leftover ceramic pieces. And it's this history that builds on different technology and gives us new inspiration for new products that I find so interesting. Each and every year, uh, the industry really does almost reinvent itself. And we're going to go through some of the big game changers as well. Um, but for most of ceramic history, uh, it was really only in the hands of master artists because everything was done by hand. It took so long to produce um, classic ceramic tile. It, most of it was fired for weeks or months in those beehive kilns that I showed at the beginning, or tunnel kilns. Um, so usually it was these artists that we mostly know for their sculpting and painting uh, that were designing ceramics for their buildings because usually they were also architects. <coughs> we can see examples of this right the way across Europe, some of the most exquisite custom ceramics um, that are still around today and the buildings are there simply because ceramics was used as a building material. Um, you know, some of the most recognizable faces have done entire studies uh, paying homage to the medium of ceramics and as part of their uh, collective works. Now, I, I generally don't have to explain all of this to uh, a European audience because when they're walking through their streets, they grow up, they see the pavers underneath their feet, they see all the buildings around them, and there's centuries of examples of beautiful ceramics protecting and beautifying and keeping their city clean. Um, so this deep understanding and appreciation for the mobility of, of the medium of baked earth is, is not something that has to be explained to you know, an architect in, in Europe, whereas 
here in North America, when I'm speaking to architects, it does have to be explained because this was our uh, induction to the world of ceramics was when it was starting to be mass produced. Uh, and early industrial revolution ceramics were functional at best. They captured all uh, some of the technical properties, but there was no mobility, there was no beauty uh, to the medium. And a lot of professionals still carry that connotation with them. And they think about ceramics not in the conceptual design phase of their buildings. They, they more think about them when they have to, they, they need something utilitarian. Um, I'm proud to say that the industry has made huge strides uh, in changing that opinion and, and the town of Spain has a lot of um, educational initiatives throughout the professional and, and uh, um, scholastic community to try and keep that going. So the, the manufacturers understood that there was never going to be that lust for this material that has so much potential if they didn't develop uh, standards of quality and, and a higher level of, of aesthetics that were achievable in classic handmade tile. So they spent tons of money and tons of time developing new ways to improve their production methods, improve their quality, uh, while at the same time keeping costs as approachable to as many people as possible and improving their aesthetics. So this is modern ceramic production. Uh, what Martin showed you at the beginning was classic dry press production. Um, and really, it started in most of the outcomes. <coughs> this is modern tile. Um, these are all the big game changers that happened in the industry. And you can see at the beginning, it was all about guaranteeing quality and keeping production costs as low as possible so that they could offer this to a broad uh, audience. So, we get single firing of tile and auto automatically caps our production costs because the kiln is our biggest cost in production. Uh, roller kilns start replacing those manual shuttle kilns and beehives. And then as we get better and better and we can uh, guarantee the quality of our material, um, we start looking at decoration. And that's where a lot of these fast and furious innovations are coming today. Uh, adding value to an already valuable product and adding more and more aesthetic options to, to clients. So I call the 21st century now the new renaissance of ceramic tile. Uh, in a trans conference last, last year, and, and that's what it was entitled, it was Renaissance Reviews. Um, I think all of the advancements are, have brought us back to that classic phase, uh, marrying all of that history in the ceramic industry with modern rapid production techniques to give us completely new aesthetic and functional options from one of the oldest materials we have. What's driving this today is the changing consumers' needs, and those of you that are looking at a career in, in product design or, or things like that, you know, obviously consumer needs have to be considered. Um, and today, they've never been broader. The needs have never been broader. People need to multitask in, in their life, and they demand uh, products that they surround themselves with to multitask as well. Um, ceramics are a champion of that, and I think we are a really great field to base uh, a product development career. Uh, you know, a lot of people, this is what multitasking looks like, I'm not saying in a car, but I'm not talking about So they want materials that do multiple things for them. And this, I found, uh, really interesting and, and oftentimes it's the simple smart innovations they don't have to be high technology they don't have to be expensive for them to make a truly impactful meaningful uh, contribution to someone's daily life uh, a lot of times ceramics um, you know, can offer a lot of these benefits without costing a lot of money either in production uh, the way they're doing with robotics and rhino or, or to be a consumer as well. So I'm going to go through some of the uh, innovations. Anyway. Um, modern terracotta, we've got Carlos here from uh, uh, Terracotta Factory that does blend a lot of these centuries old handmade techniques with some modern production techniques, uh, keeping costs down and giving new looks and reboots to old classic tile. Uh, giving us the ability to have these classic looks and, and even refurbish old installations, uh, but with new, new ways. Uh, this is a completely machine-made tile, and you can almost see the thumbprints from a traditional handmade uh, process. There's a lot of manufacturers uh, that are 
working with 3D uh, and, and exploring uh, space and value within tunnel. Tunnels don't have to be flat anymore. You saw a bunch in the robotics division. This is a traditional dry press tunnel that's been second fired and then slumped over a mall. Uh, but there's all sorts of different ways we can push extruded pieces through a, a dry press wall. That's a dry press tile that's pressed on an angle, so one, one side of the volume is much thinner than the other. But when it's laid, uh, it gives that illusion of space and depth. Inkjet is one of the, I mean, you guys have digital printers that you can print plastics and things like that. Um, there's now uh, ones that you can do ceramics as well. But inkjet decoration for glazes <coughs> is something that will really change the industry's capabilities. Um, we can do reproductions of photos and they're almost as good as a plasma TV you now. Um, Originally, there was problems with uh, different achieving different tones, like a really true black and, and a rich blue, because of the minerals used in, in traditional glazes were not possible in these. Uh, much of that has, has gone by the wayside now. We can get huge banks of JPEGs. We can do uh, a ceramic tile line that's almost 800 square feet of um, completely unique tiles in uh, 150 DPI JPEGs. Like, uh, so it can be something like a natural stone that, that we never have to quarry again, or wood, an endangered hardwood that never has to be cut down, or something like an antique newspaper. Um, this digital printing gives us the ability to glaze uh, a completely heavily molded texture. So some of those um, heavily molded extruded pieces that you were working on, digital printing gives you a way to decorate them as well. Uh, because a screen print no longer has to touch the surface uh, of the tile. And tile, because of the impervious nature of a glaze, gives you uh, almost limitless potential for durability in uh, mediums that don't offer that in certain spaces. Sometimes you can play uh, with a viewer's eye. I mean, this is a completely flat piece of tile, and it looks like it was a raw cut from a quarry bench. And that's all done uh, within jet. There's other production methods uh, in that traditional extrusion and dry press that have come out, like uh, lamina production that can make ceramic slabs one meter by three meter, three feet by ten feet. So huge, thin slabs of, of lamina porcelain that give us the ability to do, you know, cladding for doors, for fire doors, so we don't have to be a thick steel fire door, or furniture, or all sorts of other things that can add all of that value of ceramics to mediums that are outside traditional applications. Um, and it gives a lot of applications for retrofits as well. There's different pressing techniques that we can embed different minerals, pre-fired ceramic material, glass, uh, into the body of our tiles. And for some of the highest traffic areas, decoration and application is so much higher today than it was even two years ago. Uh, there's exploring different minerals within the glaze that act as catalysts. So the neat thing about a ceramic glaze is it's impervious, it's unaffected by the sun. So when you have a mineral that works as a catalyst, it, it never gets used up. So titanium dioxide works with UV light uh, to purify the air. Uh, there's systems that are using it for cladding that neutralizes um, NOx, uh, an acid rain gas, and then it transforms it into a benign nitrate. It can be paired with a green wall system that feeds the green wall, and they're working on sort of offsetting uh, the carbon footprint of buildings in that way. They're, they're using this kind of glaze behind a, uh, a chambered wall system in interiors with a high UV light to neutralize VOCs in the indoor air as well. So Tile offers a zero VOC solution for indoor spaces, but uh, this kind of application can neutralize any other VOCs in the space as well. This one was really neat. It came out about two years ago, and they're quantifying uh, the effects of it right now at Polytechnica Valentia. This is uh, incorporating phase-changing materials within the bodies of time so that um, They'll change state from solid to liquid outside, um, anywhere outside of uh, standard room temperature. So there's about a 40 degrees Celsius room temperature standard, and if the 
the temperature deviates outside of that, it changes state. The excess energy given off by that state change is, is harnessed within the thermal mass of the tile and radiated slowly. So this not only keeps energy down in the space, but it also makes tile warm to the touch. It's one of the first ceramics that isn't cold on your feet. Um, now, ceramics don't have to be tile. Uh, I love this. It's, I mean, I, I loved Lego when I was a kid. And, and this really is Lego for architects in a ceramic medium. Uh, it, ceramics can be a building material, not just a cladding. Uh, and there's factories that are working with extrusion techniques to make modular uh, ceramic formats for visual screens, for all sorts of different functionalities, so that it actually can be a building material in space uh, instead of just a cladding. And it, it gives you know spatial definition. It gives you sh uh, shapes and, and ideas to use space differently with ceramic tile. So they don't always have to be expensive, and they don't always have to be uh, part of the traditional building model. I think a lot of these innovations uh, are smart because they work outside of it. What this is is a factory that realized there's a lot of waste in the job site. Uh, construction, so they wanted to build modular pieces for um, multifamily developments and, and hospitality developments. So these bathrooms are prefabbed in, in the factory and then craned, and it's two connections, it's electrical and plumbing, that's it. Uh, so there's opportunities in all sorts of different areas to apply uh, new technology and ceramics to revolutionize that, the way we build now this one is uh, a reactive glaze that reacts to the natural uh, electrical charge of the body. So we walk up to, this is the chambered wall, uh, we walk up to the wall and instead of having the light switch to touch, we simply touch a glazed area of the tile and it turns on the lights, it turns on our alarm systems, it can turn on that air purification that happens behind it. So no longer do we have to have any switches uh, in our space. All of the, all of the infrastructure of, of an office or residence can happen behind a floating floor or chamber wall. Uh, and all of the switches and, and everything happens within the tile itself. So this is really something that defines the Spanish industry. It's, it's a great opportunity that all of you have for your work after uh, you've done your, your turns here. And, and it gives you an opportunity to reach out to the professional sector because they're actively working for um, this kind of input from programs like Harvard. Uh, there's uh, ongoing brainstorming applications that happen at Therisama. Nathan uh, presented at, at Transitos last year. And things like this that are just new, new ways to use ceramics uh, and prepositions for the industry are, are actively uh, encouraged by the industry. So here's just a quick couple of projects to get us into Antonov's uh, presentation. These are some award-winning projects uh, from Tile Spain. This was a very small beachfront community that uh, was losing its draw as a tourist destination on the Mediterranean in Benidorm, just outside of Alicante in Spain. Uh, and they revitalized this waterfront. Carlos Ferrader was the architect, uh, and he wanted to mirror the, all of the colors of the sunset on the Mediterranean Sea. So the only thing that would give this kind of uh, vibrancy and keep it was ceramic tile because it's one of the few things we can render in color and it's unaffected by the sun. Um, so he approached the extruded factory and created these two modules in about 16 colors. Uh, and it goes from all of these undulating colors for about two and a half kilometers down the speech front. It's totally uh, revitalize the area. <coughs> These are simple extruded panels for the pillars that uh, hold up the roof of uh, the Spanish Pavilion in Zaragoza. Uh, this was for the 2008 uh, Global Expo, and the theme was energy and water conservation. So this building is made to look like a forest, and these ceramic pillars uh, shade all of the glass curtain wall that, that's the entire structure of this building. Um, but they also draw water up from the lake that the building is sitting on and, and uh, keep the air surrounding the building moist and cool. Uh, so I don't know if that is in the middle of the desert, it's very, very hot. 
And this is a simple university just outside of uh, Castillon, which is where the main cluster of ceramics is. Uh, this is one of the universities that actually has a ceramicist uh, postgraduate degree. Um, and what they've done is they've used daylighting and, uh, and solar lighting to uh, light simple colored ceramic stairwells so that from every area of this university you can tell where you are and where you are in relation to the other faculties. Um, so it's very simple energy conscious use of ceramic tile. This is a standard production ceramic tile. So um, I hope I've given you all some food for thought. Uh, but maybe giving you some inspiration for some new projects. Uh, because really what's trending in, in the market and what, what manufacturers are looking for is ways to add value to consumers, give them means of personal expression, uh, and ceramic so tile is really answering a lot of the options uh, that consumers are looking for today. So I think it's a great basis for a product to uh, start. So thank you very much. I'm going to pass the floor on to determined uh, the proposal because as you see the site there it's marked in red it's uh, very near uh, the coast and really the, the views towards the uh, Mediterranean Sea and uh, the will to relate the um, outdoor spaces to the inner, inner spaces of the building determined uh, the proposal uh, these um, uh, intermediate spaces in, in our architecture are very are, are very uh, nice to use and uh, they are as important as the um, inside spaces. So uh, here, here, this piece is the uh, room that it's built with uh, ceramics and it's really um, the room that precedes uh, the lobby of, uh, the, of the auditorium. Uh, it was a competition, all our works uh, come from um, open competitions and um, in this part of the project um, the will to link the inner spaces to the park and to um, the view of the sea uh, determined um, the construction of this uh, perforated room. It was built with, um, with ceramics 
and light and shade was uh, important to proceed um, the, um, the lobby of the building. So this is the image of the building, really uh, ceramics being built. Um, not only uh, this um, perforated room, uh, but it built also the image of the building. Now it's the image of the building for all people that come to Peniscola to use uh, this uh, Congress Center. And um, really this um, atrium, that's uh, this uh, perforated lobby opener space, it's um, some piece of architecture that's uh, important in, in our architecture. Um, there are many words uh, that uh, now are part of architecture, such as patio, or belvedere, or galleria, and uh, atrium, all these um, words that sound the same in all Latin languages, and even to you also, they, they, you can get the uh, sense of these um, uh, open air uh, rooms and spaces that are part of uh, architecture and that makes really architecture more rich than only <coughs> inner spaces and uh, outdoor spaces. And the climate in the Mediterranean area really um, is very good for this uh, type of architecture. At this point, uh, the uh, lobby, uh, the ceramic lobby, uh, regulates also the temperature and um, it's configured like a plaza, like a meeting point for all people that come uh, to the uh, Palau, that's the name of the uh, Congress Center, the Palau, that's the palace in um, Valencian language. So this is the, uh, the entrance to the building, always uh, preceded by this uh, lobby that's um, built up with ceramics. The ceramics is used in quite a um, modern way because uh, the uh, enormous pieces of ceramic, they are more than one meter high, they are hung in a very light metal structure that is um, the metal structure that conforms this, um, uh, this lobby. So really it's like an insulation of ceramics and it shades and it filters the sunlight that never gets into the interior and it creates uh, a geometrical um, expector over uh, floors and walls of the, the, of the lobby. This is the display of, uh, of the building with all the organization and all the different um, uh, congresses rooms that surround the uh, main, uh, the main here, the main uh, music hall and music center. And here we have uh, the lobby and the atrium uh, that precedes uh, the, uh, the lobby. Uh, this is the lobby. Uh, it is um, quite uh, out there uh, from materials inside. We only have a dark um, Spanish stone in the pavement and then the white concrete that uh, builds up the structure also builds up uh, the interior spaces. So in this austerity, uh, really uh, the uh, ceramic is all, can always be seen from a uh, from the uh, from the inside spaces and it shades all the um, all the lobby. Well, this is the um, the main uh, music hall. Uh, here we had an important uh, research also with concrete because the um, concrete structure is also the um, uh, the ceiling for the music hall and it's responsible for the acoustics of this uh, music room. Um, it is a very thin uh, um, concrete uh, slab that also uh, the structure and the beams that cover uh, the, uh, the, the, the main hall. So, so really in, in architecture um, the uh, research in all types of um, situations, in material, in a structure, it's important. It's, it's very important for the um, for the uh, result because uh, material is not something that you put on top of architecture. 
when an architect is thinking in the project is taken at the same time in structure and in materials and all of it build up really the building and build up uh, the project. So uh, all the uh, different parts of the project are really uh, related between them. Uh, this is uh, the lobby, back to the lobby. Uh, here we can see uh, from all parts of the lobby the uh, ceramic um, atrium. That's the main feature of, of the building. This is another aspect of the, uh, the lobby. And uh, the, uh, the room, the ceramic room, that's also one of the main um, rooms for the Congress Center because many of the activities and the events are take place here in this space that's not proper out space nor inner space and it's just like um, an open air room it's an independent space that's protected from the rain but it's really permeable uh, to the entrance and to the light and to the air it forms part both of the public uh, part that's outside and it's also part of the building. And uh, one, the people can come into it and use it even when the uh, building is closed. And when the doors are open, it's part of the city. So as I said, ceramic here in this building is uh, used really not as a cladding material, but it's used uh, as an installation really. It's like a, a contemporary uh, ceramic installation. It's built with these very large, high resistant, sand colored pieces of ceramic that form a three dimensional fabric and um, shape uh, the, uh, the image of the building. This is the plan of the uh, of the atrium with all the uh, 400 pieces of ceramic that are hung from this uh, very light metal structure. And now I'm going to show some images of the uh, uh, manufacturing process for these uh, large pieces of ceramic because they were completely uh, manufactured by artisans of uh, Valencia, of this part of Spain, manufactured in uh, antique uh, kilns that gave the uh, temperature that was adequate for these very large pieces because temperature didn't, um, uh, wouldn't uh, need to be very high but very gradual. And also the clay is uh, just the, uh, the ordinary clay that uh, craftsmen used uh, year from uh, many years ago in this part of Spain. So the mold was a very simple mold uh, in this way, metal mold where the clay was put inside and then it was um, all uh, conformed by um, people, that um, artisans that uh, usually deal with these types of, of clay. It was not a large industry uh, at this time. Uh, in this year, there was hardly any research for ceramics in Spain. And it was important that all the research, we had to do it uh, by ourselves, the architects, just like you do here in all the rooms that Martin has shown us before, and by these artisans that knew how to deal with clay and to deal with um, ceramics. So now the uh, large pieces were unmolded in this way. Uh, all the machinery was very, very simple. But uh, we got what we wanted. That's the uh, three-dimensional uh, ceramics, um, large pieces of ceramic that were dried up in this way, but that were this type of ceramic was used in um, other types of architecture during the uh, 20th century, in the 50s and in the 60s. Many architects used um, three-dimensional uh, ceramic. It was um, used a lot not only in Spain, but also in other countries, in South America, for instance, in Brazil. Many beautiful architecture has been built with these three-dimensional pieces of, um, of, um, of ceramic. So uh, we um, put all the ceramic there in, in antique kilns, and it was fired with a mid-temperature gradually, 
and we had some problems we unforeseen problems because when they were fired um, uh, some of them were deformed so we had to uh, study the way um, all these large pieces uh, could be fired without uh, uh, being deformed so we had to fight a lot against uh, really um, the uh, construction company that was a uh, very um, very large construction company and was really um, looked to all this process with a bit of, uh, you know, they didn't know really what could happen with, with all this uh, process. But um, really we managed to have uh, the, uh, the uh, pieces, they were tested by, um, by high quality control and uh, they, um, they agreed with all the uh, technical uh, requirements we needed for uh, both for uh, pressure and from attraction also because they are hung so ceramic had to work also uh, with traction so it's hung from this very light metal structure I told you before and then just they were placed on site with um, the help of these um, uh, a small crane and towards, if you, you see um, the metal structure, you can see the view of the Mediterranean Sea. So really ceramic um, uh, made uh, the view uh, more, um, uh, uh, more um, like a filter, no? The view is not an open view, but it's filtered uh, uh, by, by ceramic that's suspended. So it's the, the entrance daytime and also at night time because at night time, night time then um, the, um, the atrium is like uh, the other way around it's uh, like, a, like a lamp that, um, that lights up uh, the, uh, the entrance to the, to the, to the entrance to the balao and um, the ceramic placed at this point as at the balao's entrance with this criteria of a large installation, it recovers um, the open nature and the uh, traditional spaces in our architecture perforated by light and by air and that shades also during the day and it's magical at night and that's the qualities of um, ceramic lattice that always had ceramic. Um, in this uh, construction, both uh, industrialization and craftsmanship were um, engaged in, um, in this um, work for building a really uh, a new piece of architecture that could be used by all the people that come to, um, to Peniscola. Um, the second project I'm going to um, explain really does not uh, deal with uh, ceramic properly, but it deals with a very um, interesting research in, in structure because we had uh, to cover uh, a very large and beautiful uh, Roman villa that was found up in the uh, north of Spain. It was also a competition. It has taken us um, over 10 years of work because the competition was um, in the year 200 and it was uh, open to the public only two years ago. Um, Olmeda it means uh, not only archaeology because it's one of the uh, best kept um, uh, Roman villas in Europe, but it also means landscape. Um, because uh, we have to build in a very beautiful landscape and the protection of the landscape was as important as the protection of um, archaeology. So in this case, um, architecture is, uh, confronts uh, antiquities to uh, modernity and um, also the building is confronted to nature and to the landscape. This is the situation of the, the Roman villa in the north of Spain. This, this is a look of um, all the ancient Roman roads in the Iberian Peninsula. And on this side, in 1968, uh, the owner of the land discovered um, 
by, by chance, really in an accidental way, we discovered these uh, beautiful mosaics here. Uh, so um, this Roman villa was preserved uh, during centuries, um, from the 4th century until to the 20th century, it was completely preserved. It was destroyed by a fire, and that's the reason why why it is completely uh, now it is completely uh, kept. This is an image of the mosaics. They are built with a tiny tessellae. Uh, tessellae. Uh, some of them uh, are uh, are a ceramic tessellae that are set up together with um, with this very beautiful pattern, very tiny tessellae. Here, uh, really. Yesterday we were talking about in the Boston Society of Architects about a reusing um, ceramic and about reusing um, a pieces of ceramic that are good no more. And then uh, we were talking about uh, Gaudi and the way uh, you can build a, also manufacture a beautiful mosaics with tiny pieces of uh, of ceramic. So this. Uh, ancient mosaics from the fourth century really are uh, really can be an inspiration for further uh, uses of, of ceramics. This is the largest um, uh, mosaic. Um, it is one of the largest um, kept in, in Europe. It is over 2,200 uh, square meters uh, and um, it's the meat of uh, Ulysses uh, in the uh, Odyssea. So this is the site of uh, the building. Here we see the, uh, the plan of the uh, Roman villa in the middle of the landscape, in a beautiful landscape. Uh, the villa uh, it, it extends over more than um, 3,000 square meters. And this is the plan of the villa. It's a very beautiful villa because it's completely kept all the um, all the uh, walls of the um, uh, the um, basement of the walls. It's um, a square shaped with a central patio in the, in the in the middle. And then on the um, uh, left hand part we have that other building. That's the uh, terme. Uh, that's the thermal building that was discovered once we won the competition and once we were uh, working on the uh, competi on the uh, on the building so uh, it was important to also to know how to um, explain to the visitor how uh, the Roman villa was built um, in the past times because we had the basement of the of the um, walls but we didn't have the um, the height of the space. We didn't have the speciality uh, and we didn't uh, want to rebuild uh, an ancient uh, villa with, uh, with, um, with all types of architecture but with contemporary materials and with uh, contemporary architecture. So in the same way um, the finds are shown in Rome Santiparis, we decided not to rebuild the villa but to suggest the way in which the finds were placed in the original location in an abstract canvas. So this is the uh, plan of the building. We, uh, it's now the building is transformed into a contemporary museum of the 20th century, and uh, we have the um, um, the Roman villa inserted inside this building with all the program that a 21st uh, museum needs. Uh, to function, such as a small auditorium or temporary exhibition hall or a uh, cafeteria or um, the shop. But uh, we needed also a, a pedestrian footpath that's built up in wood here in, in, in orange, uh, so that visitors can come inside the, uh, inside the villa to admire the the, the mosaics and to admire uh, the Roman villa. So we had the plan, but we did not we did not have uh, the space, and it was very important to evoke the space, the height, the rooms, and not only to show uh, the mosaics as a tapestry. So we had uh, to rebuild with contemporary materials that uh, we decided to use metal mesh uh, in a very light way. 
to promote the transparency um, towards uh, the whole villa, so the whole villa could be understood by, by the visitors. It was important to see through and uh, all the, all the uh, space uh, of the villa. As I said, it's over 3,000 square meters uh, large. The villa, this is a display of all the different elements in, in the building. Underneath we have the uh, Roman uh, walls and the Roman remain, remains with the beautiful mosaics. And then we have the pedestrian footpath. Then we have all the program. Um, built up as independent uh, small rooms inside the, uh, the uh, general display of the, of the Roman villa. And then we have a very light perforate metal um, uh, panel that, that uh, builds up the facade and then the, the metal structure and the, uh, the covering, the aluminum covering for the, uh, for the roof. It, it, it needs to be a very um, light roof I will explain because here we have only uh, four columns. Here we have three large bolts that cover the space and that could only be supported with uh, these uh, four columns set up in the middle here of the courtyard because archaeologists wouldn't let us uh, um, get in with structure in, in the rest of the villa. So the, the bolts have to be very light and um, only with these um, columns and in also smaller columns in the perimeter. So we need to build large boats. They are 75 meters span and uh, 25 meters wide. And we have a smaller one here for the thermal uh, building. But uh, another problem we had is that the, uh, uh, the, the boats it needed to be built with um, the smaller, small pieces of steel because um, the uh, building is uh, in the landscape. It's far away from um, all industrial uh, where uh, steel is produced, and we had to uh, transport uh, the bolts in modular pieces by trucks from the uh, industrial to the uh, to the site. So we had to set up together all these uh, small pieces of steel to build up what it is important uh, to build up a very high space here. This is also important because um, in archaeology um, often um, all the remains and the uh, archaeological remains um, uh, have a very little, very little um, height because usually it is uh, they are found and um, underneath other buildings. So it was important for us to build a very high space because we mustn't forget this was um, um, this was a palace. This was a palace of a very wealthy Roman, and we we had to uh, rebuild a palace with um, with contemporary materials. So in this um, zoom of the um, mosaic, this is mosaic. We noticed that the, uh, we have a boat also and we have some curtains that the same um, really aspects we have used in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the building. We have uh, the boat that is built up with this um, rhombus uh, steel structure here. They are all independent and they are screwed, uh, screwed up together. Uh, to build up this very uh, large and very thin and light dome. And uh, the structure is also the ceiling of the, of the new museum. So now you can see in all these images how um, the structure is, is also not only uh, the metal that builds up uh, the bolts, but it also builds up uh, the, uh, the image of the inside space of of this uh, museum. So these are different uh, views of the inside space with uh, the materials we used here, steel basically and wood for the uh, uh, footpath, and always the uh, tapestry of, um, of the mosaics. This is a, a plan of the, uh, of, of the boats with the modular uh, structure here. We had a uh, made a tiny model here 
Um, and um, it was important to build this model because um, we tested with this tiny model, we tested the way the dome, uh, though it, it was uh, very light, uh, it could uh, perfectly um, uh, cover this, uh, this plan and it, it didn't um, deform on this way, no? So um, uh, with the use of the model, uh, we did uh, a very um, intensive uh, research uh, at our office and with our engineer of how the way this very light structure that's really like a canvas, like a metal canvas, how it will um, work out in, in the building. This is an image of the um, of the boats and of the inner space. It's really a very light structure, so really the um, mosaics, the beautiful mosaics are really the main feature of, of the building. Well, uh, sustainability was um, also an important aspect of the, uh, of the building uh, because it needed uh, very little maintenance. Mm, budget was not very high and uh, well, it worked out very well towards the difference of temperatures in this part of Spain. It's very cold in winter and very hot in summer. And we only conditioned the 4% of the building here we have the parts that are conditioned, such as the um, cafeteria, but uh, the rest of the building has no condition, only um, air conditioning, only ventilation, and it works perfectly well. And uh, the budget for maintenance is, uh, is not, is not um, large, it's very tight budget. So this is uh, the entrance to the, uh, to the Roman villa and uh, an image of the, um, of the nearby poplar woods that uh, we used the size of the poplar woods to, um, to uh, dimension the size of the building because the problem of, of this building was the large scale of the building in an open space. Well, it worked out, out uh, quite well. We had um, a metal facade that's uh, perforated with a cordon steel it was perforated with, um, with a laser uh, procedure by uh, an artisan uh, near Leon. We worked at also very well with him. We did uh, lots of, um, of um, samples of the um, and models of the facade because we wanted it to be very light and to be very perforated so we could see the, uh, the trees beneath and we could see also the, uh, the, um, the sky and it worked out quite well because really the, the building is, um, it integrates very well into the landscape and into the different uh, colors of, of, uh, of nature. So this is an image of the, um, all the uh, models we did with, uh, for, the, uh, for the facade, for the metal facade. And the way it is, uh, it is set up with a, a light uh, metal structure that separates the panels from the uh, interior um, facade. So we have a double facade that's also ventilated. But really, everything is very simple, but it works out uh, very well now. And the building now in the landscape. And this is the, the entrance of the Orleda Roma Villa. Really, it's a very nice visit because it's a very nice piece of history that's uh, inside the, this building. And now the, um, the third uh, project I'm going to talk about uh, it deals a lot with uh, ceramics. Um, it is um, a small school in Gandia. Gandia is um, this um, town in the uh, Mediterranean coast. It is um, a small school that is uh, placed in, in a park. And um, really, um, here uh, the uh, use of ceramic was really uh, one part of the, uh, of the 
the project process, it was not a material that was just planted on top of architecture, but uh, when we uh, won the competition, we, um, we were thinking uh, all the time in, uh, in ceramic, the way, in the same way, in the competition for the Beniscola Congress Center, we knew that um, that uh, perforated atrium could only be uh, built up with uh, ceramic. In Gandia, we knew that this building had to be built up uh, with ceramic also. It is placed here in a park, just in front of uh, the um, uh, town center, that's a center from the Middle Ages. There are many beautiful um, buildings that are built up uh, with ceramic. Really, uh, in this part of, um, of Gandia, uh, the use of blue ceramic is very intensive, and it's very uh, durable, uh, and, and it is uh, very well kept. There are some buildings from the uh, 13th and 14th century that are built up with ceramic and they are perfect. They, um, the, the ceramic, uh, so it is very uh, widely used and also there are many artisans that work here well with ceramic. So here we have uh, the site of our, of our school here. Here is the park and here is the site of our school. And um, if you notice here, there are some uh, trees there were six uh, mulberry trees uh, on the site that uh, we had to cut it to cut them because the, the site we were given was uh, this uh, a small space. So uh, the um, school was meant to be set up here. And uh, when we um, traveled to the site to uh, see the site, we uh, we saw that underneath those uh, trees there was. Um, uh, a playground for children. So we thought it, it was a pity to cut up uh, the trees and it was a pity not to use that beautiful place for uh, a playground. So we decided to keep uh, the, uh, the layout of the, uh, of the trees and to keep out, uh, to keep the, um, the playground. And we decided to build up the, um, the school around the, uh, around the trees. Instead of building the school in the center of the site, we decided to build the school around here in this way, to build it around the trees. So in the interior part, we designed a courtyard, a patio again, the same word, the same word with this um, space that it is an outdoor space, but really it's the, uh, the core of the, uh, of the school and it's the, uh, the heart of the school now. So these are all the classrooms around the mulberry trees and um, all the, uh, the school from the outside is completely opaque. We'll see now some images because all the uh, classrooms open towards the patio and towards uh, the playground of the, uh, uh, of the mulberry trees. Uh, from the outside, the building has really no scale because it has no doors, no windows, and it's just uh, the image of a fence because we wanted to build up a fence in the garden. We didn't want to build up um, a, a school. We wanted to build up a fence, and inside the fence, we wanted to have the uh, former uh, children's playground. So, well, this is the plan of the, uh, of the school. It's very simple, uh, very simple plan. It's uh, a small school. If all the uh, uh, classrooms are dimensioned for the different uses. Uh, we have uh, music rooms, a small auditorium, and we have uh, computer rooms, and a small library, all meant for very uh, small children from um, zero years up to 12 years. And in the inside, uh, the facades are very transparent. They are built with wooden carpentries and uh, glass and painted white. So there can be a continuity between the inside and the outside and towards the trees and that can be seen from all the classrooms. Here in the display we see um, what I'm talking about, about the uh, um, opaque facade that's built up with um, ceramic with um, 
the uh, concrete uh, structure here that is also the partitions for the classrooms and then the large and uh, uh, sloped uh, roof that covers the uh, the classrooms that is also built up uh, with, with ceramics. Uh, the roof is sloped because in this part of uh, Spain, in Valencia, though the weather is very nice and the, mild is, uh, the weather is very mild, but uh, it rains a lot and it rains in a harsh way. So another thing we knew is that um, the roof had to be sloped in order to uh, take off uh, all the, uh, the great amount of water that rains in, in very little time. So here it's important to notice that in architecture, in the same way, uh, uh, an architect has to think at the same time in material, in structure. It is very important to use the knowledge of the past. And to use the knowledge of the past, past means uh, not to do uh, uh, old and ancient architecture, but to do uh, uh, contemporary architecture, but using uh, all this knowledge we have uh, before us, all the knowledge that other architects had. Uh, before us, in this case, uh, the sloped roof or uh, the um, ceramics. In the sections, we see how the building is completely different from the inside. It's very light and transparent, and all the classrooms open towards uh, the patio and towards uh, the trees. And this is um, the outside part of the building. It's just uh, like a fence. And uh, the trees are reflected on the um, on the ceramic uh, walls, and uh, from the upper part of the of the building, we see the uh, old uh, the ancient trees here that come uh, out from uh, the uh, from the roof, and um, um, it is. Um, Important also to notice that uh, ceramic uh, in this part is, um, is is very good also to uh, insulate from the hot weather, and um, and also it uh, shades uh, very well in a natural way. So this is a closer um, view of the of the facade. Here we. You can now see after, you can see the pieces of uh, ceramic, it's not a large ceramic, we have there a piece of uh, this uh, ceramic that is extruded with a um, can-shaped uh, mold. So uh, we had this uh, bamboo-like uh, uh, pattern um, on, the, on the fence, just like uh, as if it was um, a bamboo fence but uh, it is hollow inside, so that's the way it is uh, insulated. Mm, it's n it is not only cladding, so it is ventilated uh, from the inner part of the, uh, of the facade. This is a closer detail, always with the uh, image of the trees that are reflected on it. And uh, ceramic uh, was manufactured in Barcelona, uh, in Catalonia, by um, a brilliant manufacturer that is uh, Umeja. Umeja, uh, you can look at his web, web, his web page, all the buildings he has worked and he has collaborated with um, uh, many architects. This is the way ceramic was extruded in, in his, um, in his uh, industry. And uh, here we have all the uh, pieces once they uh, get are they come from the uh, from the kilns, and now um, here we have the complete piece of ceramic because all the piece is that is, is extruded is this part, and um, afterwards it is extruded, it is cut in this part here, and we have then two different parts of uh, ceramic. We have the can shaped part that is used for the facade, and then we have a flat part that usually it is um, thrown away and it's wasted and reused again for, um, for, uh, for another use. But uh, on this case, in Gandia, we had uh, not really much budget again. So uh, we decided uh, to use this part 
the flat part, we decided to glaze it also and to paint it white and to use it for the, for the roof because we need a flat uh, tile also for, for, for the roof. Uh, really we have more or less uh, the same square meters for the facade and for the roof so it was possible to use um, the uh, totality of the material uh, that was produced uh, for, the, for the building. And we used uh, the ceramic uh, part, the um, the can shape for the uh, for the facade that is set up over a metal structure that solves also all the uh, border lines because a problem also in ceramic is the uh, the corner, no? The, this, this border here we used it um, still to um, make uh, all these. Um, to solve all, all these problems. And we used uh, the flat part of the ceramic that was also glazed white for the, um, for the roof. This is an image of the roof. And here we have the, um, the school completely finished uh, and completely um, built up with uh, the same uh, piece of ceramic, the flat part for the roof and then the, uh, the other part for the, for the facade. Um, so, so it is um, a very, really, it's a very. Um, it has no scale towards uh, the park, and we wanted uh, really this image of of no scale and of this uh, small building uh, towards the park uh, for not altering the display of the of the park. Well, in these uh, drawings, uh, we can see how um, ceramic also uh, works in a very simple way because it, it is very good for the uh, sun that is reflected because uh, of the white color and because also of the ventilation here in all the uh, facade. How uh, the interior patio is also uh, refreshed by naturally by the uh, existing trees or how the um, also the trees shade the inside part of the patio and the, uh, uh, the the large windows of the of the classrooms so really um, uh, sustainability uh, doesn't mean to have a very high tech really uh, in architecture uh, really we prefer to think in, in common sense tech really because uh, after all um, it, everything works out and uh, really um, this is an image of the uh, patio uh, in the be beginning of spring when the uh, leaves are coming out and the sun comes into the classrooms into the large windows of the classrooms but when uh, summer comes really the uh, uh, the trees uh, they worked out very well because they shade completely uh, all the, the inside part of the of the small school. In the um, the former playground was also been transformed and we built a very simple wooden circular bench um, some something where children can climb and a place for talking and or singing or or telling stories. <coughs> you can see the, uh, the classrooms both from the inside and the outside and there's such transparency towards the, the, uh, the classrooms and towards the, uh, the, uh, the patio and towards the playground. Now the school is full of, of activity. We have one single void in the same way in, in La Olmeda Museum, we only had one void that looked uh, towards the, the landscape and that was the entrance in, in the uh, school in Andia. The uh, void is the entrance uh, to, the, to the patio, but it's very transparent also, so one can see the, the, the playground that uh, years ago was also uh, the same playground, but now it's surrounded by, by, by the school. And again, at night time, uh, it's the other way around because uh, the classrooms, when they are lit up, they 
also give light towards the uh, towards the playground and towards uh, the patio. And uh, with a single a single local material, ceramics, and uh, the trees. Uh, now Gandia has um, a school that is uh, used uh, um, intensively, uh, and um, really in this case, uh, in this case, uh, the um, the use of of ceramic um, shows the way how uh, the continuity of with the knowledge of the past and with tradition um, we can uh, we can do um, contemporary architecture and we can solve uh, the problems that architecture is supposed to solve nowadays so thank you very much thank you very much uh, and I'd also like to invite the Carlos Solana uh, to join us for the discussion. Uh, we should also say that uh, we brought actually some of the pieces here, right? So the, the building, the last building, these are some of the pieces, right? Well, you want to you see the, the pieces here on the side. We have some time just to talk a little bit and think about questions. I'd like to introduce uh, Carlos uh, Solanas, uh, uh, who is uh, joining us from Spain. We actually met last night and I thought it would be great to have you here today. Uh, since uh, we talk about materials, we use materials, but if we do so, we actually have to talk to the people who make materials and who make products. So Carlos uh, is, in that, uh, is in that business. So. Um, and I know you actually own of a company that produces ceramic uh, products. So talk a little bit about what you do before we can just answer into your questions. Uh, well, what we do, um, actually it's difficult to define uh, ceramic alias because we do handmade materials and we also pursue the material. So we are sort of an artisan job, shop, but at the same time we have uh, some uh, industrial kills, uh, everything out of Automatic, and so on. So it's, we are no, I always say, we are no fish, no meat, because we are too big to be artisans, too small to be industry. Yeah, so, but we do many uh, artisans. Yeah. I think this is actually maybe where we can uh, enter into a discussion. I think ceramics is one of those, those materials, but they're highly industrialized methods of production and, and everything, a lot of the things that Ryan showed that come out of the very controlled industrial environment. And yet there's the, the kind of still the existence and, the, and apparently interest in the craft of the actual manual making of ceramic pieces. And this is happening both on making made relatively straightforward floor and wall tiles. And then of course, uh, you know, lots of Akhala's work, I mean, you couldn't do without that level of, of craft. So it's interesting, and I don't think there's many other materials that have that broad range of ways of actually making products. Um, and I noticed in your work, Akhala, that there is that variation, right? So not all these uh, volumetric pieces in your first product, they're not all the same, right? There is that variation. And uh, you were talking about how you were trying to fight in the sense that the kind of natural behavior of the clay that, that has a life on its own. So what is the value of craft in this, in this, in this material system of ceramic? Where do we have, where does the industrialization come in? In that, in that big field, so where do we have craft? And is there a future for that? Maybe if we take a, maybe if you can uh, begin that, uh, Akhala. I, I think that, I think that both ways of, um, of using uh, ceramic um, are necessary uh, because uh, one uh, doesn't uh, say uh, that both of them uh, one doesn't say that the other one uh, they are both uh, because um, of course um, uh, are uh, more um, artisan way of uh, or investigation in ceramic uh, is needed because um, because then with artisans or with um, uh, people that uh, can think in making different ways of doing ceramic, uh, then the uh, industry can also go ahead. 
So both of them are complementary, I, I think, mm, because if, if, if there weren't any uh, artisans or any people or architects that wanted to investigate with ceramics, then uh, the large industry would go only in one way. So I really think that uh, both of them are unnecessary. And uh, in the case of uh, antique way of doing ceramic, uh, I think that uh, we architects uh, must learn a lot, uh, even actually, because um, um, we, we mustn't think that uh, old ways of uh, manufacturing and old ways of using materials are no good nowadays. We can use a lot of this uh, knowledge also for the most uh, modern industry now. So I think that both things are completely necessary because artisans need the uh, most uh, modern industry and uh, the economy of the modern industry and also the modern industry needs uh, people that can uh, invent another type of mold and another type of uh, um, dealing with clay or with Material. It's interesting in Ryan's presentation that there's a, we seem to be coming full circle that some of these industrially produced tires that begin to sort of, not mimic, but try to evoke the sort of variability that you get in the, in the, in the craft, in the crafted process. I don't know if you want to, if you have some thoughts on that. I think it's an interesting development. Right? That, that was part of uh, the point I was trying to make really is that uh, the two sides of the industry really kind of need each other. Um, the, the industrial sector uh, looks to um, studio programs and, and the artisanal sector for inspiration and, and uh, ideas of how to bring something to mass market. Uh, and, and the artisanal and, and um, institutional sector needs the funding from uh, the mass the mass production sector. So uh, the two of them are you know, in, in uh, symbiosis that, that work together, and uh, it's what keeps the the innovation chain flowing in the ceramic industry. I think. So. That's true. You mentioned you have, you have extrusion, you have the main <laughs> process. Yeah. Do they do they have intersections? Do they merge yeah. somewhere? The, what are the kind of uh, yeah we. We have like two separate factories that merge in the other Okay. Because so the kiln is the kiln is the same because the clays are the same. So actually, after drying, the process of yeah. drying is different because the water content for metal extrude is different. But after that, is scrubbed in the same way. And I would say, <coughs> for your question about if there is future in hand and product and artist product, what we see is that. Every day we're making more handmade products. Yeah. And we sell throughout Europe and throughout the world. And so, yeah. so we see, and the value, uh, for me, the value is very clear. Uh, our Terracotta uh, extruded product has a price, a handmade product has a 50% more price. And if you want uh, something custom made and handmade, it's 10% more. So it's very clear. <laughs> there is a value there. But, so you said something interesting. You said the word, the word "custom," which is the next word I would understand. So thank you for that one. Uh, because I think you also mentioned this, Ryan, and, and you, this is your work, right? You do custom pieces on the like Via Versace. You mentioned the Ryan how there's this increasing desire for customization. This is also what you do, Carlos, because you actually, if somebody comes and says, "I want the terracotta tile that has three and a quarter of an inch uh, in this direction," this you will be able to make that. Is that right? You actually yeah. make custom tiles. We do many reconstructions actually, and then of course in the 1500s we have a very metric of where you are. Yeah, yeah. So, so we just do whatever we see. Yeah. So in, in the industrialization, I mean, this has been my observation, I mean, the, the customization happens mostly on the surface finish. And it's got extremely good with the insert printing. What What else is there in the in the say, in the next 10 years? What can we expect? Is there in, in the industrialized production that, that Ryan sort of uh, outlined? Um, well, I mean, along that side of it, as far as customization goes, there's, there's all sorts of different ways to modify and, and uh, cut and decorate the surface, whether it, 
or the, the dimensionality of, of the tile as well. So like a lot of manufacturers now, because they can produce you know, one meter by three meter slab, they never have to reset their kilns, their presses, their anything. They can just run that one production and then from water jet, from lasers, from uh, traditional saw machines, they can cut different formats, different mosaic uh, procedures like you have as well um, are being implemented. So customization uh, is, is being offered and it's again, it's, it's decreasing cost for production and, and passing that savings on um, down the line as well. So, uh, I mean, that's really what design is all about, is a means of, of personal expression of what you see to the world around you. And, that, and I think that both sides of the industry are trying to provide that to people more. Personally. You alluded to, Angela, uh, you alluded to the challenges of, of doing this custom work, right? Uh, you have to write, you have to find the right partner and do you use consultants, like facade consultants, that help you design these, these systems? Do you work directly with the fabricators? Like, well, tell us a little bit about the process. Well, it, really, in, it's different in each, in each building. No? For instance, uh, in, in Peniscola, uh, we didn't have any, any consultant. Uh, we we um, designed the, um, the, the, the large piece of ceramic. Uh, but uh, we didn't have any any consultants. We knew it could be possible because we had seen uh, similar pieces in in other architectures. But uh, we we looked for uh, somebody who could build that uh, piece of ceramic, and uh, we we found these uh, artisans because at that time we are talking in more than eight years ago. So uh, there was no. Uh, innovation in this sense in, in ceramics and uh, nowadays it is nowadays uh, there is a lot of um, uh, investigation in these types of ceramics but at that time there wasn't so we only found these artisans that could uh, study with us uh, the problems of a large piece of ceramics uh, the problems really they knew the problems we didn't know them but it's that uh, ceramics had such a lots of water and uh, the uh, piece is very large so when it dries up it uh, gets uh, deformed so it, it's uh, really almost impossible to have perfect cubes so they are all a bit deformed but as we decided to hang it it doesn't you don't uh, notice it no but we couldn't uh, for instance we couldn't have a um, put it in, in, an, in another way, uh, just one on top of another, it wouldn't have been right. possible because they are uh, deformed, you know? That's, that's the reason why they are hung. And they knew about this, you know? So in this case, um, we discovered wha what uh, people that deal with clay and with ceramic, they knew what would happen. So uh, that was uh, in that case, and in the case of, um, of uh, uh, Gandia, we uh, directly uh, uh, called uh, Tony Comedia, that, that's this uh, ceramist. Uh, actually, when we were working in the, in the uh, Beniscola project and we had all the prototypes with the artisans, uh, Tony Comedia appeared in, on site and he said, well, I also work on ceramic and we said, oh, it's a pity we didn't know, know you before because <laughs> we are already engaged. So, yeah. so uh, Next time Carlos is going to be on site, it, I think. It's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it right, was right, a right. pity. Yeah. So, yeah. And he, he said, well, it would be fantastic for me to work in, in three-dimensional ceramics because uh, I like that type of work yeah. and they said, well, it's a pity, but, yeah. but now for for the next marriage, you know, so right. so when we got to uh, Peniscola, we, we called him and uh, we collaborated with him and um, we used um, part of the molds he already had in his atelier because uh, we had not uh, money to build a new mold, but he uh, um, used uh, an old mold and he transformed it so we could uh, have uh, the piece of ceramic we needed that is this uh, can shape with the uh, bamboo-like uh, pattern. So uh, 
he, he worked uh, a lot with us, we worked together, we decided the color, he gave us lots of colors. That's the blue, the, I think the one he, he built also for us. That's the blue that is used in this part of Spain, in Andia. There are many, um, many, many of the old buildings from the um, 14th century are with this blue light colored ceramic. But um, we decided to build the, uh, the building in white because it was lighter and with the sun and the reflections it had uh, it has really no presence from the from the park and between Gandia and uh, and Peninsula we also did a very nice uh, work within research work for this um, fair in Valencia called uh, Febisama Transitos uh, you told uh, we worked with him in a, um, a ceramic lamp outdoor lamp for outdoor spaces uh, and he, we, he built uh, a very beautiful prototype for this exhibition. We designed the uh, prototype uh, with um, an extruded piece and I, I didn't bring it this, uh, this work um, now but um, it's, uh, the lamp is composed by several pieces of extruded ceramic that can be uh, moved uh, so you can uh, graduate the light uh, outside and also with very good results because uh, ceramic is very good uh, in, in outdoor spaces for the rain you just can leave it and we have one at our office from five years ago I and mean, it's just like new you know it's perfect it rains it snows it's 40 degrees and it's always perfect just say click and the light comes and it's very beautiful but um, we try to um, uh, to produce it uh, but then well things in Spain are not very good now so it's just waiting there to to produce it and we have the prototype and that was also a, a nice experience with uh, ceramics so even for a lamp no, it's very versatile material not the topic. Why don't we open it up and see if there are any questions from the... Uh, I know people have to go to class, so... <coughs> any questions, thoughts? Any... Okay. With the... Um, yes, the Lila project. Uh, what was the relationship as far as designing those... What was the relationship you had with the uh, fabricator in designing the shape and how did it... Did it change as you were learning about the limitations of the material? Was there some back and forth, or did you design it first? Well, in, in, in what, for, for, for instance, in the Peninsula project, no? Uh, well, yes, we, um, the, the knowledge of the artisans uh, showed us a lot of things. So, yes, there was a, a work, uh, forward and backward, but in architecture, in all aspects of architecture, you have to do that work. I, know, I don't know any project, any building that you only go forward, no, you only have, uh, I, I tell my students, uh, two steps in advance and then one step back, no, so, and uh, for the mold, for instance, uh, of course, the mold um, couldn't be um, completely parallel, we designed it as a parallel mold and that was not possible because when you unmold, then uh, the clay, even though it is rough, uh, you can't unmold in a correct way, for instance, no? So we had to change the mold, and uh, we also had to change uh, some parts of the mold to have um, uh, a place to, uh, to situate the steel structure. And uh, also we had to change, um, well, the way we put the pieces inside the oven because though they were uh, very large uh, antique kilns uh, with graduate temperature, with mild temperature, when uh, we got the um, pieces inside the kiln, the, uh, the kilns are not very large, so we had, I know, I remember four pieces, no? Inside the kiln, the first one and the last one were burnt, and the second and third in the center were fine. So that was a problem also, and, and the uh, contractor said, well, this is going to cost a fortune, you're not going to manage our budget, so on. But the artisans are very um, 
know, they, 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 they know how to do it, no? And they say, don't worry. We always have two burnt pieces, and we all are only going to um, fire uh, two good pieces at the time. We place them in the center, and we have the two burnt pieces, one first, one last, so everything could, could uh, go out well, no? So, yes, we had a lot of, um, of dialogue with the others. In architecture, really, in all parts of the pro or aspects of the project, dialogue is necessary. Even with, of course, with the engineers, with the artisans, with the people that produce materials, with the carpenter, the dialogue is very important. And in this case, the dialogue with the uh, artisans that manufacture the um, ceramic pieces was was very important and decided many small changes that made um, the final result a uh, reality, you know? Any other questions, thoughts, anybody? <coughs> okay, well, I think it's almost two o'clock, so we'll then close the session. I'd like to thank all of you for coming from pretty far, even California as far, but certainly Spain's even further. So thank you very much for coming, you. bringing you. your perspective, insights to to the world of ceramics. Thank you, everybody who's still here, those who are left for joining the session, and uh, thanking also Tao Spain for sponsoring the event and also helping us with the research. And uh, I know they're interested in working with uh, with projects and uh, developing new ideas. So I think that's been quite. Uh, quite good that we look forward to continue. So thank you everybody and um, have a nice afternoon. <laughs>